Hi, my name is Kelsey Gerganis. My pronouns are she, her, hers. Um, I, I want to start off with saying happy Pride Month um, to everyone, and thank you so much for being part of this inclusion forum uh, uh, yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Um, I'm honored to moderate this session and hear from our very impressive panelists, whom you will meet momentarily. We have an excellent discussion planned on a very important topic. Um, as Shay mentioned, cultural adversity is definitely part of the, the international student athlete or ISA experience and can have both a positive and negative impact on overall well-being. This adversity can push our ISAs to find strength and excel, but can also cause stress and hardship. In either scenario, this is a distinctive experience from that of our, our domestic student athletes and one which must be addressed in a nuanced manner that is conducive to ISA's unique needs. Uh, what is certain is that the key to international student athlete inclusion is in the hands of those who coach, educate, and mentor them. That's you all here in attendance today. They've crossed oceans and borders to get here, and, and we want to examine how we can go above and beyond um, for them. We hope that by the end of this session, you'll walk away with a better understanding of ISA's unique challenges and needs, as well as with some ideas and tools to better support them optimally and holistically. And so on that note, I'd love to just turn it over to, to our panelists, um, hailing from all four corners of the world. Tim, I'd love to start with you. How about, how about you uh, introduce yourself and pr provide the audience with a, a little bit of background in this space? Awesome. So happy Thursday, everyone. My name is Tim Bryce, and I use see him pronouns. Um, I currently serve as the Program Director for Student Athlete Career Development at the University of Maryland. Um, in this role, I, of course, oversee all of our career readiness initiatives as far as our Gossip Fellows program and our summer internship program. Uh, but I'm also the liaison to our International Students and Scholar Services Office at the University of Maryland. In addition to working full time, uh, I'm also a second year PhD student in the College of Education Student Affairs program at UMD. Um, my research interests center on international college athletes, career pathways and career decision making. And I'm super excited to be on this panel today to not only learn uh, with the panelists, but also provide uh, some uh, phenomenal feedback for us to take back to our campuses. Dr. Kavarakis? Hi, this is Tassos Kavarakis from uh, St. Louis uh, University. Um, I'm a professor at the uh, Chaffetz School of Business. And uh, 20 years ago, uh, I came to the States after uh, practicing law uh, because of the fact that uh, there was this system here uh, that uh, would encourage uh, student athletes from all over the world to pursue uh, the best possible higher education uh, goals, as well as uh, that uh, competition that uh, they needed to pursue as uh, top level athletes. And um, over the past 20 years, we've learned a lot. I was in involved in uh, certain research projects and um, uh, opportunities to uh, consult with uh, several coaches and uh, um, athletic departments and uh, governance committees and so on. So we learned a lot and I think we've come far, but uh, as the uh, other steam panelists um, uh, comment frequently, we have uh, quite some work to do ahead uh, of us and I'm, I'm looking forward to the panel. Coach Giovanna. Hello, happy Pride Month. I'm Giovanna Mello. I'm the head volleyball coach at Cal State uh, Bakersfield. I am I'm originally from Brazil, and I have been in the United States for about 20 years. I, um, when I first came, I didn't know any English, so I do um, now am very thankful to be in a position where I'm at as a coach and help the international student athletes um, to learn a little bit more about um, the things that they can and um, can help them succeed here and, and also move forward in their careers and helping them do that as well. So I'm extremely um, thankful and happy to be a part of this panel and, and hope we can help um, everyone in, in the group. And last, but most certainly not least, Esti Vitterseven. Um, hi guys, um, my name is Esti Vitterseven and I'm an international student athlete from Belgium. Um, I've been in the US now for five years. And first of all, when I came into the United States, I went to Long Beach State in California, but I transferred to Valdosta State in Georgia, where I've played five seasons into the women's tennis team for Vald Valdosta State. I graduated last year, May, with two majors, international business and management and a minor in entrepreneurship. Uh, I'm going to be a graduate assistant next year for Valdosta State for the women's tennis team, and I will finish my MBA program. 
Excellent. So on that note, um, thank you so much, all of you panelists, for being here today. Um, I, I Before we begin this robust conversation, um, I'd like to help contextualize, conceptualize um, uh, the conversation and just share a few slides of, of relevant data um, on our ISA population and experiences. So I will share my screen. So um, across all three NCAA divisions, international student athletes are a growing population. There are now about 20,000 ISAs competing for NCAA teams. Um, our, our research staff has been tracking this trend and, and we update this chart annually, which examines the percent of first year ISAs in each academic cohort. Today, about one in eight Division I student athletes attended high school outside the U.S. And the same is true for about one in 14 Division II student athletes. Division III student athletes aren't on this chart because uh, D3 student athletes are not required to register with the Eligibility Center. And that's where we're able to gather the um, country of origin data that helps us track and look at the, the percent of ISAs in each first year class. For those of you who'd like to dig into data yourself, I wanted to show you um, on our research page, we do have a page dedicated to international student athlete participation. Here you can look at a number of athletes from each country on this interactive map. Um, but you also can dive more deeply into our trends report, which you'll see a little bit of that data um, soon. And you, you can also download a spreadsheet that includes a number of student athletes from each country and each sport uh, for divisions one and two. This slide depicts the four men's and women's sports in Division I that have the largest number of ISAs and the top three countries of origin among the first years in each sport. These data are from the freshman class of 1890, but we will have new data available for 1920 um, in a few weeks. But what's most striking about this slide is the range of countries student athletes are coming from. We have five continents represented on this slide and no two sports have the same top three countries. Our ISAs bring an enormous wealth of different cultures, languages, customs, and personal histories to our campuses. And there's not one way to meet these students' needs and make them feel welcome. Um, these students will not arrive with the same questions. Their understanding and familiarity with aspects central to higher ed in the US will vary widely. Here you uh, can see the division two numbers. The countries span again, five continents and no two sports have the same mix of countries represented in their top three. We also conduct annual surveys about the student athlete experience. The data on this slide are from our most recent 2019 goal survey, which looks at a variety of athletic and academic measures of the campus experience. We typically conduct the study every four years, so we're able to compare trends. Um, but we see some interesting differences between domestic and inter international student athletes in these data. When we look at ISAs from countries other than Canada, we see that they're more likely to have dropped all other sports, focus exclusively on their college sport prior to 13, um, and twice as likely to both have personal and parental expectations that they'll go pro in their sport. And in some cases, the factors built into college uh, decision processes also differ from um, that of their domestic peers. For ISAs, having a strong team connection in the college social, social scene were lower for um, that than of their domestic peers. While the importance of developing athletic skills, playing time, and level of competition was higher for ISAs, especially those competing in women's sports. This may be explained by the higher expectations for, for a pro career among our ISAs. And then when we think about ISAs and what may be impacting not only how they choose a choose their school, but also the challenges administrators may face in supporting the retention of these students. It's important to be aware that about a quarter of these students are the first in their family to attend college, and just over half indicated that they would have gone um, to a four-year college somewhere if it hadn't been for athletics. In the previous slide, we saw that college social scene, team connection, played a lesser role um, in their college selection as opposed to those of their domestic peers. Um, here we see only about a third of ISAs visited campus before they enrolled as compared with over 90% of US and Canadian student athletes. We also see that far more ISAs are not experiencing their first recruiting contact by a college coach until their senior year. This may mean that they've had less time to explore their options and learn about the team and campus uh, before they make the decision to commit to a program. 
And finally, uh, when, when trying to identify which of our student athletes may be struggling and at risk of transferring or leaving college altogether, often the red flags um, we're looking for are slumping grades, difficulties finding balance or mental distress. However, our international student athletes are, are generally very strong students um, and they also report lower rates of depression and anxiety than their domestic peers. However, as you can see boxed in red, these ISAs are less likely to be satisfied with their school choice, feel less of a sense of belonging on their campus, and one in four report having transferred as compared to only 14% of US and Canadian student athletes. The point of sharing these data is not to cause alarm, uh, where we wanted to draw your attention uh, to is the data that shows us how international students may differ from their domestic peers when it comes to college expectations, athletic expectations, and the college choice uh, process. So for our first question, I'd love to start with you, Dr. Kabarakis. You have conducted extensive research, authored many publications on international perspective student athletes, including your doctoral disser dissertation on amateurism and the professionaliz professionalization threshold. Based on your research and the direct feedback you are getting from many former and current ISAs, what takes place before an international perspective student athlete commits to an institution that coaches and administrators must be aware of? In view of this forum, we had a chance to uh, create a brief survey um, over the past week uh, or so. We had 150 responses. We had uh, student athletes from 39 different countries. More than 100 were in Division One. We had several transfers. And other than the quantitative uh, data as well as the qualitative um, information that really um, is uh, projecting a very compelling uh, uh, story. Uh, the one thing that stood out in my mind was the um, international student athletes gratitude, the appreciation of being heard, having a voice in regard to the issues that affect their lives and overall uh, their higher education and uh, athletic experiences. Um, over the past 20 years that we've been in this space, uh, we've had a chance to see uh, different um, things happen. We had the advent of new technology, social media outlets, easy and free to navigate online platforms. And now it has become much more feasible for coaches to recruit internationally as opposed to um, some of us will recall uh, fondly sometimes of uh, the days of VHS tapes, packages being lost, dubious documents, expensive telephone calls, and recruits uh, that coaches half-jokingly refer to as shrinking at least a couple of inches during their overseas travel. Um, now, a lot of data sources and talent-rich candidate pools exist. Um, coaches and administrators still need to do their due diligence in terms of academic and athletic background. There are more um, sources for uh, information, frames of reference for um, us to create those successful win-win cases. We do need to keep in mind that a major driver for international recruitment traditionally has been uh, for programs and coaches getting a competitive recruiting advantage, thus recruiting those difference makers that otherwise they wouldn't have a chance to recruit domestically. But in that process, uh, important aspects, fundamentals, intangibles, necessary prerequisites go by the wayside sometimes. So um, in specifically in terms of the ISA's uh, issues, we need to um, uh, keep in mind that uh, coaches, administrators, uh, folks in the trenches need to remain on alert, that uh, matters need to be ad addressed, including amateurism, academics, so the sport participation issues, um, the process to acceptance uh, through the um, uh, academic uh, admissions process, securing student visas, and um, and recently, including during the uh, uh, COVID challenges that we've had over the past year, there have been um, more uh, issues that uh, ISAs had to deal with, uh, technical glitches even during the um, past year of um, standardized tests being rendered uh, optional, uh, some institutions still require them, and particular English tests were um, required, but uh, not all alternative tests were um, accepted by all institutions. Uh, prospects were unable to complete their testing timely, uh, including situations where uh, in predominantly Muslim countries, um, student athletes were were finding themselves in uh, in a predicament where uh, the uh, testing um, uh, systems will pick up 
for example, the call to prayer from nearby mosques, and they wouldn't be able to complete those uh, those tests or being kicked out of the system. So there are several issues that, that we see and compelling stories that we need to um, be aware of, as well as um, helping the helpers, helping the coaches, the administrators, and the folks that help uh, those student athletes go through the process. Um, and to complicate matters a bit further, um, now administrators and coaches are finding themselves in, uh, before these unforeseen events of uh, embassy closures, um, uh, requesting expedited processing, and uh, several times uh, that is not feasible. There are, at this point that we're having this forum, hundreds of thousands of international students that are waiting um, patiently with our 20s in hand, and they cannot get into uh, U.S. embassy appointments for one reason or the other. So uh, operating timely and with a sense of urgency is imperative so that uh, these international students and student athletes are, um, are going to be able to make it timely on campus and uh, carry on with their higher education transition process. I will include some general themes from what we've seen in uh, our recent survey and uh, uh, looking forward to the panel's uh, reflection and discussion on these. Um, we encounter um, uh, students uh, reflecting on challenges with uh, in terms of their terminology and not being familiar with certain terms, um, things getting lost in translation, um, including the fact that a lot of uh, ISAs uh, were initially thinking that they would get a full ride. And full ride is not quite full in terms of uh, tax implications, in terms of uh, fees, and just even the cost of uh, going through the entire process uh, and landing finally on campus. Um, there have been entanglements in terms of documentation, credential evaluations, um, inconsistencies uh, uh, that um, uh, complicate matters in terms of international student athletes getting um, uh, conflicting uh, information from one coach and institution versus the other, uh, issues that uh, pertain to health and mental health. Uh, health insurance uh, in several institutions uh, is not covered for uh, international students, and those are mandatory or insurance packages that international student athletes also have to uh, manage and not always are covered. Uh, important tax issues, uh, a lot of international student athletes are not aware that um, everything other than tuition and books are taxed starting with a 14% federal rate, immigration, visa, embassy appointment issues that we mentioned, and really um, lack of preparation frequently in terms of all the aspects that uh, they need to be uh, um, addressed as soon as they land on campus. So we can discuss a few more things, but uh, looking forward to the rest of the discussion. Wow, thank you, Dr. K. That was a, a wealth of a wealth of information you could uh, put on an entire clinic related to that information. Um, but I think it's a really great uh, segue to Esty. Um, she's a recent graduate. Uh, congrats, by the way, Esty. Um, you are in a, a very different place than you were when you first came on campus. And, and Dr. K just gave a lot of really great examples of challenges and barriers and themes um, that ISAs experience. I want to take you back to some of those early days on campus. Um, when you first arrived to the U.S., uh, can you share a bit of what it was like at the beginning? What were some of those hardships uh, you experienced? And was it mostly just in the first year or did some of those hardships last throughout, uh, you know, your time um, as a student athlete? Yeah, so since I transferred, I actually got to experience the first days um, twice. So I actually have two different kind of stories. Um, the first school I went to Long Beach State, I actually had to stay in a dorm, which I really liked because I got to meet so many new people and freshmen and not only athletes. And I think that's really important for like international student athletes to also meet just regular students just to talk about like regular stuff, not only sports. Um, and then whenever I went to Valdosta State, where I'm actually now, um, coach still had to figure out if I could stay in an apartment or not because I was still pretty young. I was 18 when I transferred. Um, so I had to stay two weeks in someone's living room um, from my tennis team. And it was pretty stressful because I had to like organize everything by myself. Coach let everything up to me, like or like fixing a bank card or phone for number or like the rent or, and that was basically like so new for me, but I'm pretty glad he did that because I learned a lot from it. Um, I grew enormously from that. So yeah, as you can see, it was pretty stressful. The first couple, I would say three weeks, 
But once I was settled, I was I could actually focus on my studies and actually on my tennis. So that was really nice. Yeah. Excellent. Thanks so much, Esty. Um, I, I want to move on now to Coach Giovanna. Um, with you being a former international student athlete yourself and now the head of a program at CSU Bakersfield, uh, which has many ISAs on the roster. Surely a lot has changed since your days as a student athlete, but what are some of the difficulties difficulties that you see with your ISAs coping? Uh, what's difficult for them to cope with and perhaps uh, remember facing yourself? Yeah, I think, you know, the first thing that comes to mind is definitely the culture differences that they each uh, and every international student athlete face based on each of their countries you know and there is there is a process there that I remember taking a little time learning what it is there you know that is so different here in the United States that they have to experience so it, and it is a shock wanting it or not it is a shock sometimes the majority of them now they come and they speak English but yet there is an adjustment that needs to happen um within the school and then the you know the culture that everything is different the athletes what we're doing and then you have to add the sports in the middle of all that that they have to play and sometimes you know you, for each sport there are some differences as well in different countries and so you add all of that and and it's very stressful i can remember i mean as esty said i i struggled very much in the first i mean month i remember I, you know, crying and calling my parents almost every day saying, I, am I going to get through this? You know, it's, it, it's, it's a tough, um, it's a tough transition for them. And I don't think as coaches, we really realize uh, until, I mean, for me, I've been there so I can, you know, I'm a little more, almost a, list, a little more than what Esty was saying to the extreme, like, is everything okay? Do you need this? Do you need this? Because I, been through it and I don't want them to go through the same things that I went through but at the same time I know that they need that to get better and I know that it's a process that will take a little bit of time for them to adjust and, and I um you know I, I want to help in every way possible but there are certain things that they're going to learn on their own as well but uh, I think that those three things you know adjusting to the culture is the biggest thing of all because it's it's such a big shock when you first arrive knowing English or not it's it's a big shock excellent thanks coach Giovanna um, I, I want to transition now to uh, preparing for the future uh, we've talked about some of those struggles just initially but Tim um, you're a rising scholar in this space especially in, in terms of career development uh, you are currently pursuing your PhD in student affairs and leading Maryland student athlete career development program. Um, I'm curious in your research and practical experience, do you come across any disparities between domestic and ISA, domestic student athletes and international student athletes as it pertains to opportunities after their playing career? Yes, and I would say the, the word disparity, I think, um, is used a lot when talking about uh, ISAs, right? Uh, the conversation around ISAs is um, really rooted in deficit-based, and that's not what it should be. And I think what we're doing at Maryland is uh, pivoting to a strengths-based approach and really identifying what aspects, what experiences, uh, what skills, what expertise can you add value to an employer, to a grad program, to a professional program uh, that's, out, that's not just in the U.S., but also outside of the U.S. So I think the conversation about ISA career development is one that we think about how do we keep you here, how do we prepare you for you know opportunity back um, your home country or another non-U.S. based country. We also need to consider how interna internationalizing our work helps prepare all of our student athletes uh, on our campus or within our member institution. Uh, so, for example, um, there's a lot of conversation, a lot of research has been done on the adjustment. We're not talking about the career development. A lot of research being done on transition, right? <laughs> We're not talking about internship search. A lot of conversation, a lot of potlucks. We have too many potlucks going on, not enough conversation about CPT, OPT, and H1B that also may help prepare ISA to stay within the U.S., but also identify opportunities where we can prepare them to you know, go, go to Canada, go to Greece, go to Italy, because those um, conversations that preparing this looks much different. I think additionally, um, when thinking about career development uh, within the U.S. higher education context, is rooted in U.S. ideals, right, and American privilege. And first and foremost, again, I'm from Ohio. I'm not from I'm a non-U.S. based country, but I chose to pursue my Ph.D. to identify how I can use my American privilege to liberate international student communities. And so as we think about what career development means within the NCAA sport model, I think that's important. But we also need to include conversation about what career development, what career readiness looks like in that student athlete's home country, because the resume may look different. Right. 
interview prep may look different. Dress and attire may look different. And so not to include that in the conversation, particularly around career development, um, is malpractice and something that we should all uh, account for moving forward. That's excellent. I, I think you bring up a lot of really great points, um, really simple points that need to be shared, you know, related to dress, related to what's the process of interview and all that stuff. So thanks so much for sharing that, Tim. I do have a follow up question for you. Um, you also serve as a liaison between the athletics department and the international affairs office. How significant is it that these two units have a relationship and why is that so relevant to the inclusion of of our international student athletes? Yeah, I think it's, um, it's important, but it's also essential. Um, and so I think what we've seen in just higher education as a whole, we've seen, you know, multicultural centers, you know, be built. We've seen LGBT equity centers be built. Right. Um, but separate is not always equal. And so I think the conversation, particularly in athletics, is that we want to send ISA to the, I, the IS office, right, or the international student office. And quite simply put, that office is not uh, equipped with the staff, right? They're understaffed, they're under resourced. Um, and their primary focus is to help uh, those ISAs remain uh, compliant with immigration laws, right? We, as an athletic department, need to be more uh, critical and be more uh, deliberate in how we support ISAs in all that we do, and not just sending them across campus or down the street to talk with the uh, IISS office or to send them to the Social Security office to get a SSN without explaining, you know, why it's important. I think additionally that the the meaningful part of that partnership is that we're educating them on the culture of college athletics and they're educating us on the culture of what it means to be an international student in the U.S. And so things like um, our career networking night, right, and being able to collaborate with them and be like, hey, which employers have you seen sponsor visas for international students when they graduate from the University of Maryland? That's important. And we're not having that conversation. And so I think we're definitely beginning to think more critically about what our partnership looks like, not just for ISA, but for all international students on campus. Because to Estee's point, there's an entire community that has been neglected on um, U.S. college campuses for many years. I'm um, just definitely trying to help change that. Uh, and I think we can start, particularly in college athletics. Thanks so much, Tim. Um, that's really some really great insight and feedback. Um, so we've identified quite a few challenges and, you know, institutionally related to culture shock, educationally um, related to career development and career planning. Um, I, I want to transition now to discussing some potential solutions. Um, Coach Giovanna, CSU Bakersfield has a really cool, very unique initiative called the Runner Ambassador Program. Could you tell us about this great inclusion work and, and what kind of positive impact it's had on the international student athletes on your campus? Yeah, I think it's huge. Um, one of my former uh, student athletes was a part of uh, helping create that. And so um, you know, we were, we were collaborating a lot when they were creating. And I think that, um, it, first it's a safe space for them to go in and talk about certain things that they're going through and then they're struggling, you know, and it all international students can kind of get together and have these conversations. And then two, it just, it's a, it's a preparation for what one they're about to face and the things that they're going to have to, um, to learn how to do as simple as signing your I-20 before you go home, opening a bank account, um, how to read, you know, pennies, American money. Like, how do you read all the different, you know, pennies that you have here that in different countries, they look different. They're different. The taxes, as it was mentioning. Um, I think that there are so many little things that, um, that international student needs to learn and, and, you know, it's international student athlete specifically that, um, having that place that the runner ambassador program that CSU created, it's, um, pretty awesome to see, you know, the benefit that they have had, um, to have that in our institution. And I'm happy, uh, to have been a part of it. And I just see that, you know, that they're, they feel more comfortable and they learn and, and there are certain things that, um, that it doesn't happen if you don't have a place that can teach you some of these things unless someone knows, okay, we have been through this. We have these kind of um, curriculum, as you call it, for you to learn a little bit of what uh, are certain things that you will need uh, in this next maybe four years of your life here in the United States. Excellent. Thanks so much, Coach. Um, the next question I have is open for for all of you. Um, Considering the needs of our international student athletes that we've discussed, uh, what are some of the low-hanging fruit or simple actions 
uh, that coaches and administrators can do that will alleviate some of these hardships. And I'll open it up to, to any of you to chime in. Yeah, first and foremost, identify I'm in a liaison from the athletic department. Um, it really should be a team. So whether that includes academics and student athlete development um, and compliance by identifying or appointing people so that ISAs know who they can go to um, when they have questions, comments, or concerns. Um, I think, too, and it's something that uh, Bakersfield and Coach G, um, thank you so much for your work in creating a handbook that many schools have adopted since then. But creating an ISA student athlete handbook, right, um, with information about transportation, about the adjustment to college campus, about career development, about food and dining, right? Because all the things that we, as particularly as Mar Americans and those who have American privilege, don't think about when going to college. I, mean, I think the third thing, especially uh, from a career development standpoint, is asking employers, do they sponsor visas and including them in your career networking night and career fairs, right? Because again, to not include them in the fair does a disservice to international student athletes who want to um, pursue employment in the U.S. And then the last thing that I'll say, particularly for those who were on the academic side, is understanding uh, the effects of major selection and OPT and CPT and H-1B for those that do want to stay in the U.S. because that has a direct impact on which um, employment opportunities they're able to pursue once they graduate. I actually also have a couple. Um, like, I would say doing more get-togethers with international students. So you, like, the school is sometimes so big, like, it's nice to just, like, see if there's someone else from your country. So you basically already have, like, kind of like a bond, like you share the same culture and stuff. Um, and then also like helping filing your tax, like tax is such a big thing in America. And I had to do everything by myself, like getting a tax number. And yeah, I mean, you can get so much money from that. And if you don't know, or like some people don't like people don't help you, it's kind of hard to do it by yourself. And then also, since you're an international student, a lot of students don't have cars. So I think like getting or finding transportation to get your necessities like food or like I had a bike, but it's pretty far biking and like it's hard to have everything on your bike. So yeah, so transportation and I don't really want to ask my coach all the time. Um, so yeah, but we also have a shuttle actually like every Wednesday it goes to the mall and to the Walmart. So that's sometimes something I can use. But yeah, that's also something it's really helpful to international student athletes. Yeah. And and that's the uh, the thing that I would say it's, you know, maybe you don't we don't necessarily have a program in your institution, but creating a, a student athlete, you know, as we've talked about a student athlete orientation, even if that, you know, for for the athletes that in the beginning, they arrive, they very first arrive here are some of these things that you will, you know, you will need here are some of these things um, that you can as even as transportation, here are the, the different options that you have. Here are certain things you can do for taxes. Here are someone who can contact. Like just on a re, like a starting orientation can help that student athlete from the beginning. I need to figure it out some of these things. And even if you end up doing it by yourself, so so be it. But I think that understanding when you first arrive, what are what are those things that you will need. I, I want to commend everyone on the panel for coming up with exactly the uh, items that uh, we, we see from even this recent survey. And uh, you talked about everything in terms of the cultural assimilation with the, the challenges. We've heard from more than one student uh, athlete, one international student that uh, was alone during Thanksgiving or Christmas. Dorms were closing, cafeterias were closing, and they didn't really have access. They did, as, as Esther mentioned, it would be helpful to have a uh, uh, sister or brother that uh, would actually uh, have a chance to help in that um, in those tough moments, uh, being hit with fees, taxes, issues uh, in terms of insurance. Um, as uh, Coach Giovanna mentioned, the, uh, those programs that could be institutionalized are so critically important and so helpful for all these uh, specific procedural and substantive issues. So there are uh, there are things that are happening across the country, and I think there are these uh, lessons that we can all learn from those types of programs that really can help those international student athletes. Excellent. Um, thank you all for for chiming in on on that question. Um, my my next question is open to to you all again. Um, we know just by the examples you provided that these small things do and can uh, really make a difference. Uh, but I do want to dive in a little deeper. And Tim, you, you've kind of touched on this a little bit uh, broadly institutionally, but beyond some of those small steps of individuals at the institution level, 
Um, what does international student athlete inclusion look like broadly? What are some examples of broader initiatives? Um, what are some of the barriers which may prevent athletics departments from championing these broader initiatives? Um, can, can any of you touch on ideas for that? The U.S. internationalization is happening, like whether we want it to or not, right? Whether college athletics wants it to or not. Um, and so we need to embrace that um, and begin to internationalize, internationalize our work. Um, so what we're doing at Maryland uh, to do that is one, um, I, well, we changed our SAC structure to include a director of international affairs on our SAC exec board on purpose, right? To not just provide representation and, and voice at the table, but also help our domestic student athletes understand what it means to be an international college athlete, but also how they can use their American privilege as student athletes to then uh, support and uplift the experience of ISAs at Maryland. Um, two is, is forming partnerships, global partnerships with grad programs and professional programs, particularly from student athletes who want to go back to their home country and pursue medicine or pursue law or pursue PA. And so we see that. And I think everyone at every school has different uh, countries in which more sports um, probably recruit from. And we recognize that. And so how can we identify those um, those partner schools in different countries um, and tap back in with our uh, U.S. school? And lastly, what I'll say is connect with your, uh, not just your IAAS office, your International Students and Scholar Service office, uh, but also your Office of International Affairs to identify opportunities where both international students and domestic students can begin to be involved, not just in service, but also study abroad work um, in different countries. Because again, we know that's important and also can help to um, prepare, prepare them to be career ready when they graduate. Um, Dr. K, do you have any ideas for broader initiatives and, and maybe... What are some of the barriers that may prevent athletics departments for um, implementing the broader initiatives? Right. So we've come far the past 20 years. So, we, you know, we, we want to keep in mind that we want to have um, kind of that, that um, uh, perceived competitive equity. Uh, we, we ask students to uh, go back to those bedrock principles of uh, the NCA and Bilo 2 and, and make sure that those principles that often conflict are fairly balanced. And international student athletes need to uh, uh, have that fair treatment as other student athletes as well. But as, as this panel has um, uh, discussed, there are certain additional challenges for them. And we can't um, uh, underestimate the power of collective action. Uh, and, and I love what Tim is doing. I mean, that, that, is, that is really priceless work and, and valuable contribution to, uh, to uh, the future international student-athlete experience. I think there are those challenges and barriers that we have to overcome. I think governance um, uh, bodies and, and committees would actually help with, uh, along those lines. Uh, one example was even as, as simple as last year when we had uh, issues in terms of immigration policies and, and uh, things that uh, really complicated matters in terms of the visa process, that um, it was collective action through higher education institutions that led to specific actions in terms of uh, whether online courses would be uh, offered as well as um, uh, full face-to-face -face programs that would allow students to, uh, to still come and, and remain in the country. Um, a lot of times, I think we... Um, we miss the fact that uh, institutions and, and uh, NCA member institutions, as well as other organizations and associations, can really help in terms of uh, impacting action in D.C., impacting action internationally through embassies and uh, immigration student visas issuing policies where the process can be streamlined, can be somewhat more, more efficient. And also some student athletes are telling us in these surveys that they would appreciate some help from institutions or the NCA in terms of uh, uh, fee waivers if they're bona fide. Uh, um, need-based um, uh, waivers uh, uh, issues if there are uh, partnerships, as uh, I think Tim had mentioned, partnerships, partnerships with uh, testing agencies, partnerships in terms of having one free test or one free practice test and so on. There are several things that I think through collective action can really help international student athletes. And, and as, as the more work uh, continues, I think um, these experiences and, and this entire world of college sport will be truly uh, kind of this, this um, uh, rainbow effect fact, as literature we used to call it, with all these benefits uh, to uh, be enjoyed by everyone, including uh, coaches, administrators, and fellow students, for sure. Um, there are um, different restrictions in which govern what career opportunities international student athletes, international students as a whole, can pursue while they are in the United States. Um, the first of which is curricular practical training, uh, which stands for C well, CPT for short, Optional practical training, OBT for short, I and mean, then H-1B visa, work visa, um, once they graduate and pursue OBT. Um, CPT, OBT, and H-1B are all dependent on the, the international student's major when they are an undergraduate student or a graduate student or a doc student. So, for example, if you have an international, an ISA who's majoring in criminal justice, but wants a job in medical sales, that literally, literally cannot happen. The government will not allow that to happen. 
And so my point, particularly to academic advisors and student athlete development professionals, is to have a conversation much sooner than major selection occurs on one, <laughs> do you want to stay in the U.S. or not, right? If yes or maybe, you need to consider your major. No, let's, let's talk about what that means. But then two, whether you want to stay in the U.S. and work or go elsewhere, you still need meaningful work experience to then be able to explain and contribute on some sort of resume or documentation to an employer grad program. And so we know the NCAA model is unique to the United States. The NCAA, uh, other countries, they may be familiar with it, but do not know and or appreciate the NCAA model like employers in the U.S. do. And so oftentimes you have international students who graduate from a U.S.-based uh, school, go to another country that's not the U.S., and that employer is like, where's your experience, not understanding what it means to be a student athlete. And so I think the more we can do to better prepare our college athletes, our ISAs, while they are um, in our athletic departments, the better we'll be, not just with connecting with them to um, employment opportunities when they're are graduating, but also staying in touch with them as their alums um, and want to contribute in future years. So we're nearing the end. I, I wanted to ask you, Dr. Kabarakis, what, what do you think um, the future looks like? Uh, ISA's numbers are increasing. We saw the data. We hope their experiences are improving. That's why we're here today, right? But um, just in your research, are there trends that you recognize uh, that folks on campus should, should prior, prioritize monitoring? Right. So um, as, as we were saying earlier, um, the work that has been done over the past 20 plus years uh, has gone from a, a much more restrictive, narrow approach of a certain policies that the NCA was um, uh, applying um, decades ago to uh, a more uh, flexible and uh, more common sense approach. And we have to really kind of dig deeper into that common sense approach and making sure that those policies would interpret them be applied um, appropriately, fairly, but also uh, in, in a way that would ensure that um, uh, opportunity is uh, assured for all student athletes, including international student athletes. For example, now we're talking about changes in transfers, uh, t- changes in uh, uh, NIL and so on. So there will be more access to funding, will everyone be afforded um, equal opportunities for access to that funding? Um, using uh, NCA funding in terms of, for example, Student Athlete Opportunity Fund or other uh, funding that could potentially uh, uh, assist certain um, areas where institutions might not have access to full cost of attendance for international student athletes to cover uh, uh, and making sure that they have their uh, tax liability issues um, uh, taken care of. And and a lot of times we we need to keep in mind that a lot of them don't have access to additional funding. They have to uh, be uh, outstanding students, outstanding student athletes, but uh, they don't have time or the access to work on campus. And a lot of times they are stretched very thin and that's not a win-win situation for the future. Um, we talked about, you know, issues of health insurance and a lot of uh, student athlete respondents uh, the ASAs uh, reflected on mental health I think part of that was because of this really challenging year with with COVID and so on so a lot of them uh, um, reflected a lot deeper into those areas of homesickness of of, uh, mental health issues and I think that reflects on the coaches as well coaches that are listening to this they know that this is not just on the student athletes so um, there are areas that I think we, we will have have more work to um, uh, to do, but I think we're getting there. We've really covered a lot of ground over the past couple of decades, at least. And um, I think there are those areas of, of uh, action, systemic action, institutionalized action, as Tim was saying earlier, and, and collective action that will help in terms of uh, growing opportunities. And, and as some colleagues have said, uh, diversity uh, should be nurtured and should be celebrated in terms of grow, growing opportunities for, for those interactions to, um, for all those uh, student athletes to enjoy those benefits from those, um, those exchanges, for sure. Well, I think that uh, just based off of some of those points you just touched on, uh, Dr. K, uh, they want to know if, if the survey included any question related to the COVID-19 pandemic, and in general, uh, what might be the biggest challenge for ISAs who have stayed here in the U.S. during this pandemic? And I, I open that to you first, Dr. K, but I, I welcome any of the panelists to chime in uh, on the second portion of the question. Yeah, a couple of points. The ones that were actually here uh, had um, 
uh, issues and that, that other student athletes uh, encountered that a lot of the freshman international student athletes experiences were vastly different in terms of what we've, and, uh, we've seen in the past in terms of that cultural assimilation, the additional challenges where you don't really have that, that um, uh, live interaction with your, uh, with your fellow uh, classmates and teammates. Um, some uh, student athletes had the chance to have their, their bubble within their team, but they, they missed out on that uh, broader interaction, particularly when they were uh, only taking online classes in terms of those interactions with other um, uh, mates, so becoming uh, a bit more uh, diversely and culturally assimilated uh, within the student, the general student body, which is a big uh, goal. On the other hand, uh, major challenges occurred uh, for the student, international student athletes, that, some of whom were not even able to uh, come to um, uh, compete and, and be on campus. They were even though some of them had I-20s and uh, were uh, waiting to go through the process, they were allowed to take online classes, but the, obviously the interaction wasn't there, they weren't here, and some of them are still going through the process of uh, trying to come to the state. So so there are major issues this, uh, this year, and um, we're, we're still going through them. So that's where I think... Um, uh, right now, as we're having this discussion right now, we have quite a bit of work to do to get some of them that are already student athletes and are no student athletes coming into this fall to uh, to get them here timely and obviously deal with more of these challenges that are uh, post-COVID relative for, for those international students coming over. I want to open up uh, the question related to challenges during during and, and, and almost post pandemic. I mean, we're still in the pandemic, but we're hopefully nearing um, a time period where we do start to see things get back to normal. But I want to open it up to the other panelists related to some of those challenges our ISAs have experienced during this difficult time, and especially if they were here in the U.S. away from family and and uh, potentially by themselves for a lot of the time. So for me personally, um, I had to leave the United States in May when COVID ha actually happened. Um, so, and then I couldn't come back in August because the planes were not flying and stuff. So I had to do like online classes and that was actually really tough because like, I wasn't used to study at home anymore, like here in, in Belgium and just like, not having the atmosphere of actually being in the library and doing your group work together with your team. Because like when I'm doing my master's, I have to do so much group work and it's just nice to do it face to face and not do everything online. Um, and then I also have a couple of friends um, that are international and they couldn't go home because the airport back home was closed. So they had to stay in America. And yeah, that was just really actually sad to see to just, yeah, without family and, you know, all the friends are home. That was really sad. Yeah. Yeah, for us, uh, similar situations of uh, athletes having to stay here the whole time uh, because they couldn't go home. And the ones that couldn't come in, uh, one of the, the first things that I think about is the time difference. Um, so classes would be, you know, at 3, 4 p.m. and it would be 3 a.m., 2 a.m. at home. So they had to make adjustments uh, in that way, even taking a test sometimes at 2 a.m. And, and having to have conversations um, you know, with professors to try to accommodate uh, them in those situations, because that that was, I remember, one of the things we dealt with, um, with a couple of our international student athletes. And then, yes, the, all the online stuff that for all of them that have reported back said um, it was a lot uh, different and, and a little bit more difficult not being face to face with the professors. Esti, I did want to ask you one more question. Um, what what's the best advice you can give um, an incoming ISA that's about to relocate? What advice would you give their coach? Yes, I do have some a uh, couple of advices. So first of all, I actually worked with an overboarder, and an overboarder is like a person who actually like helps you with the process of coming into the United States and actually find finding a school for you. Because like I really needed it. Because sometimes it was just so overwhelming, the whole process and all, and getting all these emails from these schools I had no clue about because I never went to the uni United States and I didn't know which school was really good or which one wasn't really good. Um, so yeah, this person really helped me. So that's a good advice I can give to the incoming international student athletes. 
Another advice I can give to the athletes is actually to be open-minded. Like just accept the cultural differences. Just ex- I just um, accept everything basically. Like it's such a nice experience and just studying in another country, another language. You're going to meet so many friends and teammates from all around the world. Just take everything of it and or just take every bit of it and just enjoy everything. Um, another advice I have is to not talk, not talk only um to the coaches or head coaches or assistant coaches, but also talk to your teammates. Like it's nice to come to this university knowing these people already, or just ask these people questions um, that you don't really want to ask the head coach. Um, So you're going to be a little bit more comfortable with these teammates. And then for the coaches, I also have an advice is to make um, basically like a to-do list and add all the costs, what you have, for example, doing a TOEFL test or SAT test, all these steps, they cost money. And for me personally, it was always adding up and adding up. And I didn't know like in the beginning how much it was going to cost. So if you make like a to-do list with um, all the costs and you can just check things off because I'm super organized and I like just to check things off when I've done these steps. Um, I also think it's going to speed up the process of recruiting and getting these new athletes into the United States. So that's a couple of advices I have for them. Excellent. Thank you so much, Esty. Um, we have time for one more question and uh, potentially a brief answer for from one of our panelists. But uh, the question is, that our OISS staff is awesome, but I think there is fear on both sides for athletics to be advising on SEVIS um, slash compliance rules. Um, I think we do a good job of supporting our ISAs, but always refer them to OISS for formal advising. Have any of you navigated that? Um, it deals with fundamentals of communication. There are very experienced uh, athletic administrators, coaches that have been through this uh, hundreds of times. They've consistently recruiting internationals and institutions that consistently recruit international students. So they have kind of the ecosystem and the um, very knowledgeable staff on uh, uh, on campus. Um, Sometimes it's uh, a fantastic staff uh, colleague uh, at uh, the uh, Office of International Services that would be very helpful and and, uh, guide those um, uh, coaches and administrators on the athletic side through the steps uh, of the way. Um, As simple as, let's say, for example, the timing of a CBIS transfer when someone would transfer from a JUCO or from another NC or NNI institution, when would the um, uh, key point of transferring the CBIS so that they can avoid issuing a new I-20 with a different CBIS number so that would actually cost another entangled process Process, another $350 uh, for the CVS fee, and uh, and sometimes they would actually be on the outside looking in because they wouldn't be able to go for a timely appointment in the embassy. So there are those uh, issues that could be preemptively treated as long as there is communication and there are point uh, folks, and, and as, as uh, some of the panelists mentioned, training and um, ensuring that um, I think, again, the NCA will, will have a bit of um, um, input and contribution in that in terms of providing some training, uh, ensuring that there are so um, uh, there are more of those uh, knowledgeable individuals um, on, on campus. And, and uh, as to uh, back to what Estee is saying, also helping the helpers. There are more agencies, more folks involved in this business now actually get input from them, give input to them to make sure that uh, things would be proactively uh, treated so they do not complicate things but actually alleviate some of those concerns and streamline the process so so there are things that um, you know knowledgeable folks uh, that are either on the athletic side or on in the uh, institutional side uh, international services can help uh, and there are always those things that are unforeseen and and you have to be ready to deal with the unforeseen so those are things where uh, you generally prepare and you have to have that teamwork and the communication on campus particularly when you're dealing with issues such as we've had now which during COVID that might might have been beyond the control of international student athletes or beyond the control of the institutional staff. And they had to deal with all of a sudden expedited letters, issuing letters, the DSO writing letters, but also having support from the AD or the SWA or the coach. So those are things that, you know, powerful teamwork can go a long way. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. K, for that, for that information. And on that note, Uh, I want to thank you all for joining us today. Uh, Thank you to our incredible panelists for sharing your experiences and knowledge. Knowledge, I, I truly enjoyed this conversation.